I'm Eric Krauss from the uh, Division of Dermatology at the Health Science Center. We have a small residency program. We have four residents, and um, it's a three-year program. We take care of patients down at Texas Diabetes Institute at Santa Rosa and at the VA. A lot of the uh, patients that uh, you'll be seeing today could be representative patients at the VA mainly. Lots of sun damage. The uh, talk is entitled uh, Dermatological Problems in Aging in the Handout, but what I'm going to talk about is skin cancer and its precursors. So I want to give you some information on what to be looking for in your patients as far as diagnosing skin cancer and looking for those conditions that are precursors so that you can hopefully head off the development of skin cancer in the future. This slide is dated 99, but it's, it's, it's still pretty accurate. Half of all new cancers are skin cancers. So if you take all the cancers and total them up, including breast and colon and lung, the complete total, half of them will be skin cancer. There's approximately a million new cancers a year, skin cancers, and I believe that that's uh, probably a gross underestimate. The majority, four out of five, are basal cell carcinomas. Another 16% are squamous. But those 4% will, will certainly account for the majority of deaths. There are relatively few deaths related to basal cell carcinoma and approximately 1,200 deaths related to uh, squamous cell carcinoma. And so for skin cancer in total, it's going to be somewhere around nine to 10,000 cancer deaths related to squamous cell carcinoma. So quick mathematics, you can tell that the majority estimated to be 7,700 for the year 2000 are due to melanoma. So I will certainly spend some time on melanoma, but I will go through each of the major categories of skin cancer, show you representative examples, in fact, lots of examples. You'll probably think I'm over-repeating myself. But personally, I don't think you can see too many slides of what you're trying to recognize in the future. We'll talk about basal cell carcinomas first. There are variations of basal cell carcinoma. For those of you that are familiar with skin cancer at all, you might be familiar with recognizing the nodular form, the raised up lesion that ulcerates in the middle. That might be the one you're most familiar with but you may not be familiar with the other varieties. There's still basal cell carcinomas, and when you start seeing a lot of other things, you have a wider differential diagnosis. This is an, a, a classic example on the nose of a nodular lesion in an elderly individual, and these are what we call pearly papules, it's about five millimeters in size, right there on the Ehler groove, close up of the same picture. 
to show you a little bit of a telangiectasia, so a pearly papule about five millimeters in size. And this would be a typical example of a basal cell carcinoma that you might be able to recognize already. Another example of a nodular basal cell with the telangiectasia. Over here is a lesion that you might confuse with a basal cell, but it's actually an, uh, a nevus that has lost its pigment over time. One of the things about normal molds or nevi is that they develop pigmentation early on in life, and then over time, as you become older, you start to lose that pigment. And so now you've got a flesh-colored papule that might be difficult to determine whether this is a nevus from the past or whether it's now a skin cancer. As far as how are you going to make that determination just looking at it, you really can't. You can suspect that it's a basal cell carcinoma or it might be a nevus. The, the thing in the history is the most helpful. If you can get the patient to clearly state that this has been there for 20 years unchanged, that's not going to be a skin cancer. If they tell you, on the other hand, that this is now about the past year, this has been growing, they never had it before, that's likely to be the skin cancer. More than likely, what they'll tell you is, I don't know, and then you need to biopsy it. As basal cells uh, progress, they, they become larger in that local area. At this time, they tend to also uh, form an ulceration or erosion in the center and form a crust. You don't see any crusting here, but you've now got a depressed center. You still have your telangiectasias. You have this uh, pearl-like or opaque-like nodule in the skin. So this is a sonometer size, classic basal cell nodular type. And here's an example of uh, a patient that you might see at the VA. We see a fair number of patients that have multiple lesions. Over time, for whatever reason, they tend to be neglected, and slowly over time, they get larger. So he's got some smaller lesions here, and they're progressively larger depending on the location. So he's got a minimum of uh, six, seven lesions there, all basal cell carcinomas. Now there is a variation of basal cell carcinoma called a pigmented BCC. And these are the ones that get confused with melanoma. These are also the ones that are most likely to be seen in darker skinned individuals. So our Hispanic American population tends to get, the, when they get the pig, basal cell, they tend to get the pigmented form of the basal cell. And as I said, this is the one that, uh, if you're not familiar with this form, you would say that this is probably a melanoma. Again, you have this pearly-like quality, this little rim of extension down here, and around the outside, you have this uh, opaque pearly-like quality and lots of pigment in the middle. And that's what's going to help you. Another lesion the same way, you still have that nodule, the breaking down of the center, but now you have spotty pigmentation in various areas, including an extension out to here. But if I took away the pigment, then the nodule you could easily buy as a nodular basal cell. So it shouldn't change the fact, the fact that it has pigment shouldn't make you change your mind. Here we have a fairly large uh, inner canthus lesion with a lot of crusting, but that same pearly-like quality to the edge and some pigmentation. Now there's also a variation of basal cell that we call cystic basal cell. It looks more like a cyst. This almost looks like it's got some fluid in it. They're not too common. This is a variation that you need to know about, be able to recognize. It's called a morpheiform basal cell. And the key thing about this one is it looks like a scar. This particular lesion has that same raised up area that helps you distinguish this as a basal cell. But a lot of times this is not here and all you see is this scar. 
So you have to be careful not to be calling it a scar. If the patient can give you a logical explanation for why they have that area, that's fine. But a lot of times they'll say, you know, I don't ever remember traumatizing that area. It's slowly growing over time. The reason this variation is important because you're looking at the tip of the iceberg. Whereas the nodules, you can make a three or four millimeter uh, rim around it and excise it that way. This one here has little tongues of basal cell going in all different directions. When you try to excise this, the excision is going to be twice that size, at least, and you won't know for sure exactly where it's at. You won't be able to effectively guess at the margins. And so this is a very important lesion, or feoform type basal cell. Another variation of the same thing, a scar-like lesion, a depressed area that resembles a scar. Whenever you see that, that's normally a very significant skin lesion unless somebody can document that that truly was either some kind of a surgery or some kind of a trauma. And the last variation of basal cell that I want to talk about is the superficial form. If you know anything about dermatology, you would look at that and one of your, you would start to think about differential diagnosis. Could this be a, a partially treated form of psoriasis? Could this be numula eczema? Could, be this, could this be tinea corporis? So there are variations on a theme here. You're looking at this and, you, and you're thinking dermatitis. You may go ahead and give a topical steroid. You might think it's, an anti, it's a fungal infection. You might give a, an antifungal. Uh, many primary care physicians that I know go ahead and give uh, what they call Lotrazone, which is a combination product. Now, one of the things I would like you to remember is that if you make a diagnosis of something and you apply, apply appropriate treatment and you're sure the patient is using it and it's not working, there's a problem. And the problem is normally going to be a misdiagnosis. So if you go ahead and you treat this with topical steroid and they, get, they do not get any better, there's no improvement, then you need to either biopsy it yourself or send it for biopsy. This here is a superficial pigmented variation. So you have the same type of superficial plaque with pigmentation on it, but you can recognize this because of this kind of raised up edge as a basal cell. But it's also superficial and it's a pigment variation. Now, if you go ahead and neglect basal cells, they can grow just like the tortoise in the hair, eventually if the hair fools around long enough, the tortoise is gonna to get to the finish line first. Well, if you neglect basal cells long enough, they can become very large. And you certainly don't wanna be dealing with a huge tumor like this when you could have dealt with it 15 years ago. This is a um, radically ignored or mistreated basal cell. That's the other thing that can happen. If you make a diagnosis of basal cell, you go ahead and you do your surgery, you don't get it all, and it starts growing from underneath, then over time you have a problem. I spent 30 years in the military and part of my time I spent in Honduras. And here you have a Honduran woman that has allowed this cancer to grow over many years and she lost her eye. So I'm not saying that basal cells are normally that dangerous. What I am saying is you can't ignore them. This is an example of a white scar with a couple of papules coming back. So this was treated. It was treated either with cryotherapy or electrodesitation and curatage. It left the white scar and then over time the, there's the recurrence. So you want to treat the recurrence with excision. One of the ways to treat these cancers is with cryotherapy or liquid nitrogen. So you mark out the edge of the tumor, you give a three or four millimeter border, and then you freeze it with liquid nitrogen. And what that results in is this ulceration 
in its erythema and weeping, and over a period of a couple of weeks, it heals up with a white scar. So that, that concludes a short session on basal cells. Now I want to switch over to the precursors of uh, squamous cell carcinoma. There really are no precursors to basal cell carcinoma. There are basal cell carcinomas from the beginning. Now the precursors to squamous cell carcinoma are actinic keratoses, Bowen's disease or squamous cell carcinoma in situ, or arsenical keratoses, and I'll cover the first two. Many of our VA patients look exactly like this lady. They have a tremendous amount of sun damage. And whenever you see uh, somebody like this, it means that they have a tremendous amount of exposure to the sun over many years, and genetically, they don't tan well. These are the individuals that uh, years ago got out in the sun, they got a burn, nothing happened, they healed from the burn, they went out and got another burn. Now that's a type 1 skin. There's a type 2 skin that goes out, they get their burn, and then they start to freckle. And for some reason, they feel that if they go out there and do this enough times, the freckles will join and they'll get a tan. Genetically, it's not going to happen. No matter how many times you go out there, freckles will not join and give you a tan. It's not going to happen. So these people have to be discouraged from, from that kind of behavior. Now, as far as the actinic keratosis are concerned, a lot of times you can feel them better than you can see them. Here, they're pretty obvious. They're flat. They're erythematous. They're scaly or sometimes a little bit crusted. Sometimes you just... Uh, patient will tell you I have a, a rough non-healing spot on the skin and you can feel it better than you can see it. It's kind of a little rough sensation to your finger. This is an example of keratotic papules on the backs of the hands. The backs of the hands are major areas of sun exposure as are the forearms and the face and also the V of the neck or any other parts of the body that doesn't isn't normally uh, clothed. The actinic keratoses, they can start out flat, and as they start progressing towards squamous cell carcinoma, they start elevating, and they become more keratotic. And this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about kerat keratotic material, that kind of rough and wart-like uh, appearance. Now, you can also get sun damage on the lip. So somebody that has the fair skin, their lip gets exposed, and they kind of have this abnormal looking lip where you have a lot of discoloration. Sometimes you will actually have some scale crust and some erythema. This is all damaged lip. Actinic chylitis, but that can go on to, to uh, develop into a squamous cell carcinoma. So this has to be treated also. The treatments that we normally employ for actinic keratosis the most common one is liquid nitrogen. We freeze them with cryotherapy liquid nitrogen. When you have so many of them that it's not practical to freeze, which happens frequently at the VA, then we use a, a 5 fluoro uracil cream called Effudex cream. And I'll show you an example of what happens when you use that cream. You can also use chemical peels. There's a thing called photodynamic therapy where you apply delta amino levulenic acid and you allow that to penetrate the skin and you expose the patient to a type of light that the chemical reacts to. And you can also use a dermabrasion method where you have a phrase-like instrument with a little motorized tool that kind of just peels the outer layer of the skin. And this is an example of what Effudex does to skin that's damaged. You wind up with an intense erythematous inflammatory reaction with lots of erythema and crusting. Now, nobody wants to walk around looking like that. But it's for, the, for, for practical purposes, there's no way you can freeze that skin. You'd have to dip them in a tank of liquid nitrogen and just hold them upside down and, and pull them out before you could get enough freeze for that entire area. The good thing about Effudex, it, it only uh, reacts with abnormal skin and doesn't touch normal skin. So here you have an example of the upper lip. That's normally a sun-spared area. So is the neck here. And so are the eyelids. 
and that's why you're not getting any reaction because the skin's not damaged there. This is an example of a chemical peel, trichloroacetic acid, and it kind of gives you a white frosting and then the, the skin desquamates and the superficial actinic keratosis goes with it. Now, leaving actinic keratosis and going on to uh, what we call squamous cell carcinoma in situ or Bowen's disease. Here you have actinic keratoses and now over time they're starting to thicken up and enlarge. So I cannot tell you with certainty that that this whole thing represents a full thickness uh, squamous cell carcinoma in situ, but certainly a majority of it will. You could take this off and probably find areas that were still at the dermal epidermal junction and actinic keratosis, full thickness, a squamous cell carcinoma in situ, or even some invasive features where it's a squamous cell carcinoma. So what I'm trying to tell you is when you leave these go long enough, some of them are going to start moving on towards squamous cell carcinoma. And this is a classic example of uh, what we refer to as Bowen's disease or squamous cell carcinoma in situ. It's an erythematous plaque. You look at that and you say, well, maybe that's psoriasis or maybe it's some kind of dermatitis. That gets back to what I was talking about before. These things have differential diagnoses. And if you apply a topical steroid, you're not getting a good response. You apply your topical antifungal, again, no response. You need to biopsy it. Now, the larger ones will go on to be crusted. And then some areas of this is going to be in situ, and a lot of it will be squamous cell carcinoma itself. This is a lesion that we call a keratoacanthoma. It's characterized by a small, the patient will normally tell you, you know, I had a little pimple here, a little bump, and now in the last two weeks this thing has doubled in size. And they're actually telling the truth. Sometimes you get a little exaggeration. But these are the lesions that are very rapidly expanding in size. And clinically, they look like a squamous cell carcinoma. And histologically, they may resemble a squamous cell carcinoma but they're this thing we call a keratoacanthoma. So as far as you're concerned, if you see somebody that tells you this is rapidly growing, and clinically it looks like this nodule with a central keratin area, your differential is keratoacanthoma versus squamous cell carcinoma. For practical purposes, because clinically and histologically they resemble each other, just treat it as a squamous cell carcinoma. As the keratosis starts to enlarge and they become more wart-like and more thickened and more keratonic, that's when they've converted over to squamous cell carcinoma. Here you have an ulcerative lesion in front of the ear. It's over a centimeter in size. The differential is squamous cell versus basal cell. Here you have an individual with a large tumor, Sarge keratotic tumor on the forehead. The thing about uh, most squamous cell carcinomas is the keratotic material that you see, this kind of crusted, scaly material. That's going to be your tip off that this is more likely to be squamous cell than it is basal cell. Large tumor in the center of the chest. You kind of wonder how in the world did anyone let that go for so long. It happens. This turned out to be a squamous cell carcinoma. It could have been lots of other tumors. It's, you know it's bad just by looking at it. Here's a vascular looking lesion. It turned out to be a squamous cell carcinoma. It could have been a basal cell. It could have been an amelanotic melanoma. The um, the most uh, difficult diagnosis in dermatology is to diagnose melanoma that has no pigment. It's almost an unfair challenge. But you always have to keep it in the back of your mind, especially when it looks like this, this friable, granulation-looking tissue. Nodule with keratin in the center on the ear. 
similar looking lesion on the lower lip. The reason I want to show you those two and also add in any squamous cell carcinomas developing in scars, these three locations are the most serious of the squamous cell carcinomas on skin. If they occur on the ears, if they occur on the lips, or they arise in scars, these are potentially metastatic lesions. These are the ones that if you're going to have a death from a squamous cell, it's going to be the very large squamous cells or in squamous cells in those locations. This thing has been there for years and growing slowly over time. You initially look at that and you consider infection high on the differential diagnosis. But how could it go for years and not be biopsy? This turned out to be a squamous cell. All right, what are the factors? Recurrences and metastasis, a large lesion, two centimeters. Of course, the, the, the deeper the lesion, the more likely it is to cause trouble when it's poorly differentiated on histology. I've already mentioned ears, lips, and scar. A tumor that has recurred. You, got, you, you thought you got it the first time it came back. Ner nerve involvement with the tumor. This one is important, it's one on immunosuppression. For those of you that are seeing patients, especially in this hospital, in the VA and in the university system, you're gonna see transplant patients. These patients that are, are at major risk of developing skin cancers because of their immunosuppression. These patients can develop squamous cell carcinomas within a week. The toughest patients for me to take care of are the heart transplant patients and the renal transplant patients. If they have sun damaged skin as a background before they get their transplant and then they're put on immunotransplant medicines and now their skin is activated, they're gonna develop these cancers just one right after the other. It's almost impossible to keep up with them. I used to see them every two weeks and have, have them, they had walk-in privileges in between times. That's how quick these cancers are developing. So what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is when patients get counseled before transplant, one of the major counseling efforts should be about their skin. It's a real tragedy when the transplant survives and the patient dies because of a metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. How do we treat? We treat with cryotherapy, which is the liquid nitrogen. We treat with curatage and electrodesiccation. That is, you numb up the lesion, you, you, you shave it flat with the skin, send that to pathology. You go ahead, use a curette, scrape it, and you use an electrocautery to desiccate the base. If a patient has multiple medical problems, they're a poor surgical risk, they're on um, 15 drugs, including Coumadin and several other blood thinners, and they're not a good, can they're not sur a good surgical candidate, then radiation is certainly an option. We have the CTRC down the street. That's an excellent, uh, um, um, that's an excellent uh, option for treating cancer. Certainly surgical excision, and more specifically the Mohs variation of that kind of uh, surgery is the way to treat skin cancer. The Mohs micrographic surgery is a technique by which you microscopically control your surgery. By that I mean you cut out what you think is the border, that tumor is looked at microscopically, and if, the, um, if there's only one section that continues to have tumor at the border, then the surgeon goes back and excises only in that area. If you are clinically guessing, you're just taking a wide margin and hoping you've got the borders. This technique eliminates the hope and specifically allows you to get the areas that need to be uh, gotten on extension, and then so you're also conserving tissue at the end. To close it. Okay, risk factors for developing melanoma. I mentioned briefly before what a type 1 and type 2 skin is. 
The type 1 is the individual that burns, never tans. The type 2 is the one that burns and gets, gets freckling and very minimal tan. Immunosuppression is a major event for melanoma, as is a family history of melanoma. If a per person has had a melanoma before, they now have a ninefold risk of getting another melanoma. Some of the precursor lesions are dysplastic nevi, an increased number of regular nevi, a congenital nevus, and a lentigo maligna. These are the precursors of developing melanoma. Okay, so putting it another way, the people that are fair-skinned, now just because somebody is blonde doesn't automatically mean that they can't tan. So if, but if you're, if you're uh, blonde or red-haired and blue-eyed and you've got freckles, that's an individual that ha is really sensitive to the sun. Actinic keratosis is a major marker for those that have uh, poor ability to tan well. Freckling, uh, family history. Now this here, back uh, years ago, even before sunscreens, uh, one of the things that mom used to tell the child is go out and uh, go out and play. They come back with a burn and the next thing is, well, go out and, and toughen up your skin. That used to be the message many years ago. Well, hopefully we've gotten away from that kind of attitude and we realize that burning is not good for your skin. It doesn't toughen up your skin. It just makes you more susceptible to skin cancer. The melanoma precursors I've mentioned, it's lentigo maligna, dysplastic nevi, congenital nevi, and acquired nevi. This is what we refer to as a lentigo maligna. It's a large brown patch that has dis dispigmentation within it. Now, many, uh, many of you will see a patient that has a little bit of brown area, and we call it a solar lentigo, or liver spots. This is the thing that you get on the back of your hands as you get older, and sun-exposed area, in people that are very fair-skinned. But what I'm talking about is a large patch with this irregular dispigmentation. So you have darker brown and lighter brown, and it's large in, in the setting of somebody that has fair skin, lots of sun damage. That's a lentigo maligna. And I'll show you some other variations on a the theme. Again, notice the freckling. That's an immediate sign to you that this patient is at risk. And then they have this large patch with light and dark areas of pigmentation. Now here's a woman that had that large patch for many years and then actually developed a nodule within it. So now it's a lentigo maligna melanoma. So it's a precursor as a lentigo maligna and then some of those are gonna go on to develop melanomas. So that's why you want to excise them before they have an opportunity to do so. This is an individual with a congenital nevus and a nodular melanoma that's developed within it. So a person that is born with a congenital nevus has some risk of developing a melanoma over the lifetime. Now the small ones like this, the risk is probably around 1% over a lifetime. As you get to the large ones, some of them cover an entire bathing trunk area. The risk for that individual is around 10%. But they're, they're very unusual. And then you have some that are in between that have a small risk too. Is so the, is although the, the risk... Is the congenital nevus, is that flat? The congenital nevus is this portion here. All of this portion here. And then within that nevus, develop this nodule. Okay? So this, this, they were born with this portion. And then over time, this little nodule developed. Another uh, precursor for melanoma is what we refer to as uh, dysplastic nevi. 
This plastic nevi also go by the term atypical molds. And when you look at somebody that has dysplastic nevi, the key clinical feature is that the nevi don't resemble each other. If you take a global look of this person's back, they're all different sizes and colors and shapes. Most nevi, when you have a lot of nevi and they're not dysplastic, they tend to be about five millimeters in size or smaller, and they're fairly uniform in their appearance one to the other. When you have dysplastic nevi, they're normally in the five to 10 millimeter range. They kind of, they tend to have some uh, erythematous component to it, and they don't look like each other. Here's a couple of close-ups of the dysplastic nevi, kind of a reddish-brown component, a little bit darker here, and certainly irregular. You might say, well, how come that's not a melanoma? Therein comes the difficulty. It could be a melanoma. It could be a dysplastic nevus. This is one that might have to be biopsied. Here's another one. You have uh, a fairly large 5 by 10 millimeter lesion. It's darker, it's not too irregular, but a little bit irregular. It's a little lighter in the center than it is at the periphery. You look at it, you know it's different. It's not your normal mold, but it's not that classic melanoma either. Okay, uh, the skin cancer uh, update for 99 had new cases of melanoma at 44,200. That, that, that the uh, number for 2,000 has been revised to 47,700. Now obviously nobody can say that exactly this number is going to occur in the year 2000. But what they're doing is using their best guess based on the, the incidence that has been occurring. The rates of melanoma keep going up. The lifetime risk back in uh, 99 was estimated to be 1 in 79. It's now estimated to be 1 in 74. The expected deaths are, is now up to 7,700. Men going up to 4,800. Women, 2,900. This is an important point here. Who are you seeing at the VA? older Caucasian men. So when they're in your office, these are the ones that need to have their shirt off, their pants off, and you need to be looking. They might have a dozen other problems, but one of those problems can kill them, including melanoma. Okay, the types of melanomas, you have a superficial spreading form. This is the, the, the pigment across the surface of the skin. You have a nodular form, which is an elevated dark, dark black papule nodule. You have the one that I just described to you, lenigo malignant melanoma. And you have a form that's out on the fingers and toes, referred to as acral lentiginous melanoma. So here we have a little slightly irregular, about five millimeter flat papule. This is going to give everybody a lot of difficulty. It's not round, it's not oval, it's a little bit irregular. You look at that and you say, well, maybe it's melanoma, maybe it's not, maybe it's a little dysplastic nevus, maybe it's a, just a little bit irregular mole. You don't know. You gotta biopsy this one because the key thing is you don't know. I don't think anyone's going to confuse this one. This is uh, the custodial engineer can make this diagnosis. So now you have a large lesion, very irregular, reddish brown here, pigmentation, little nodules here and there. This is clearly a superficial spreading melanoma. This was seen on an 18 year old, 18 years old, two centimeter melanoma right there, smack dab in the chest, where he had to have looked at it every day. All the features of melanoma, the asymmetry, the irregular borders, the color changes, the large diameter, everything you want to, this, this is, is it across the room diagnosis. He developed a nodule right here, two millimeters in depth at age 18. Back of the leg, very commonplace for the ladies to get their melanoma. 
irregular borders, fairly uniform in color, but the irregular borders. Right above the, uh, the shoe line here on uh, the lower leg, an irregular superficial spreading melanoma that has now developed a nodule within it. Again, another classic example. Look at the background. Look at that fair skin. That's that same skin. Every photo is the same skin. Irregular pigmentation, a nodule. This is an area of what we call regression. It's now developed a white area. That's even more ominous than not having the regression. So you start seeing white, ar white areas within what you're calling a melanoma. That's a worse prognosis. Now you can have pigmentation. This is at the base of the toe, the great toe, on the plantar side. And this is some irregular large brown pigmentation. If you put that on the face, we'd have probably called it lenigo maligna. But now on the foot like this, we're calling it an acral lentiginous melanoma. A uh, similar lesion on the foot that I've been showing you that occurs on the legs, irregular pigmentation in a nodule. Pigmentation in the nail bed. Unfortunately, when the nail is there, that's the, the diff it's a difficult diagnosis, and sometimes on a knee-jerk reaction, when physicians see a dystrophic nail, they tend to call it a fungal infection. I'm not sure why, but we've got to get rid of that notion that every dystrophic nail is a fungal infection. Only half the time is that true. And especially when it's related to pigmentation, you have to be concerned about the melanoma. And that's what happened here, and that's also what happened here. A melanoma grew right on the nail bed. In African Americans and dark Hispanics, when they develop melanoma, it's going to be acral lentiginous melanoma for the most part. Now, a, a large tumor on the earlobe with, with pigmentation, this, these are unfortunate type lesions. Here you have a lady with a large tumor in the, in the genital area. I show this slide specifically to say that um, a lot of times physicians don't get to look at the skin. And it has a lot to do with uh, modesty or whatever time. But for some reason, the uh, patient will come in and they'll come in with something, a little rash on their arms and nothing else will ever get checked. Now, not very often are you going to see a large fungating tumor there, but my point is, if it never gets looked at, it never gets diagnosed. And the patient obviously let that sit for many years before it got to that point. Somebody should have picked that up. And this is what happens when melanoma gets out of control. This uh, patient died a day after I took this photo. This is metastatic to the skin. Okay, so let's look at some information about melanoma. The, the prognosis for a melanoma is determined by how deep the melanoma cells are in the skin. And that's referred to as Breslow's depth. In the past, we've also used, and some people still use, Clark's level. So measuring from the granular cell layer of the epidermis down to the deepest melanoma cell, that's the Breslow depth. Clark's level is determined by where the melanoma stops in the skin. If it stops in the epidermis, it's one. If it's part of the epidermis and part of this papillary dermis, it's two. If it's all filling this papillary dermis, it's three. If it gets down into the deep dermis or reticular dermis, it's four. And if it extends down to the fat, it's five. But mainly we use Breslow's depth. Prognostic factors, the depth of invasion, the deeper the depth, the, the, the worse the prognosis. When you're dealing with a millimeter or less in depth, then you have a good prognosis. 
you have an intermediate prognosis from one to four millimeters and you have a terrible prognosis greater than four millimeters. Ulceration of the lesion, that just shows you that uh, this thing, the lesion has been there for a long time and it's gotten to the point of ulceration. You certainly don't want to make the diagnosis of melanoma when it's already ulcerated. That, that patient's not going to survive. Regression, I told you about the, the white appearance in, within the melanoma. Clark's level, if um, it's, it's obvious that if it's down into the fat and Clark's level five, that's gonna be worse than if it's in the epidermis, Clark's level one. A radial growth phase means it's extending out on the surface of the skin. The vertical growth phase means it is now penetrating the skin and that's where you get into trouble. Patient gender, females do better than males. Okay, as far as uh, when you have a patient with a one millimeter or less melanoma, you want to find out about whether the patient's had one before. Remember, if they've had one, be if they have a melanoma, their next one is, uh, the chances of getting the next one is nine times greater than getting the original one. Total body skin exam. You want to check the nodes. The excision, the surgical excision for a, for a one millimeter or less lesion will be a one centimeter border. For a two millimeter lesion will be a two centimeter border. Beyond that, they'll either be two up to three centimeters. No more than three centimeters in the closure. The days when you see this huge defect with a graft and a deep, deep area, uh, usually on the trunk, those days are historical, hopefully. That should never happen again. There's absolutely no medical reason for that to ever happen. There's no studies that are indicated and x-rays are not necessary. Now we're talking about a lesion that's one millimeter in depth or less. Now once it goes over one millimeter, then things start becoming a little bit more gray. What we do here is anything over a millimeter f up from one to four millimeters, I send the patient to the CTRC for Dr. Alexander Miller to, to, to look at. He's an oncological surgeon and he also does sentinel node biopsies. So that's the area that you, you want to send patients to, to him to determine whether there's a sentinel node involvement. That's the first node going away from the tumor. So if that node is not involved, then you would not expect any uh, distant spread. Okay, and my final slide uh, is this guy jumping off this big cliff. Can you believe this maniac? No sunscreen. Okay, so in, in, uh, what I have done is try to show you a lot of photographs of skin cancer. I think if you're going to make a diagnosis, you have to have something to go on first. And then after that, you need to see a lot of patients preferably a one-on-one -on -one situation where you have somebody that knows what they're doing and you're learning from them and you're actually looking at the patient. As far as uh, care is concerned, if you're surgically inclined, that's fine. No reason why you can't deal with the skin cancers. If you're not surgically inclined, the best thing you can do is make the diagnosis and, and the appropriate referral. As far as basal cells are concerned, we see uh, basal cells every clinic uh, there's no reason to, for us to uh, see them in on, on an emergency basis, but certainly we'll see them in a timely basis. So that doesn't mean six months or 12 months from now, maybe in the next month or two. If you see a squamous cell carcinoma that's obviously arising on uh, sun-damaged skin and it's flat and it's fairly small, again, we're talking about that same month or so. If you're seeing something on the lip, on the ear, within a scar, that's yesterday. And if you see something that looks like melanoma, that's also yesterday. Okay? Any questions? All right. I will. Well, it's that time of the season And all through the house 